Thank you everyone for joining uh, for this uh, webinar. We are with Dr. Muhammad, Muhammad, a faculty member at Chemical Engineering Department. He will discuss and share his research that is, ba that is gallium based alloys for flexible electronics, patterning and 3D printing. Um, uh, the, the Dr. Muhammad recently joined our department. He is a, a he graduate from uh, U.S. Uh, doctor, sorry, I, I forget your university name. It's, it's North Carolina State University. Uh, North uh, Carolina, I'm really sorry, North <laughs> Carolina. And then he worked as a postdoc in Purdue for a time being. And then he went back to Egypt and served as a faculty member in chemical engineering. So the doctor, the floor is over to you and uh, please go ahead. Okay, thanks Dr. Rosa for the uh, nice introduction. So um, yeah, so um, today I'm, I'm gonna be talking about some of the work that I've been doing in uh, my PhD and in my postdoc uh, in uh, NC State University and in Purdue University regarding the gallium-based alloys and their applications for flexible electronics and patterning and 3D printing. Um, so before I go through the uh, work that I've been doing, um, I'd like for, for first to talk a little bit about, about gallium uh, and give... Uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, sorry uh -huh. to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Is it possible for you to turn on your video? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, if you feel comfortable. Thank yes, you. Uh, just a second. Should be on now, right? Yes, perfect. Okay, it's worked. Okay, so uh, so I'd like first to talk about gallium uh, for a like, few minutes. So gallium, as you see, this is uh, where it sits in the periodic table, um, um, and it, it lies in uh, in the uh, group A in and in period four um, below aluminum and uh, above um, indium, and one of the like, fun facts about gallium that, that it was not discovered when Mendeleev uh, uh, set his periodic table and he predicted that there is an element that has the atomic weight of 31 and he predicted the properties of this element like the melting point and the oxides of this element uh, pretty pretty much close to what was found six years later when gallium was um, was discovered. Uh, the uh, uh, the When we talk about gallium uh, um, I think not a lot of people know a lot about gallium, but gallium is a soft silver color colored metal uh, and in the standard temperature and pressure. And usually when we talk about gallium, people uh, know gallium for the gallium arsenide, which is used in photovoltaics and solar cells and, and these, these kind of things. And the gallium nitride or indium gallium nitride, which are used in um, LEDs. Uh, and, and these are the like very, very serious uh, and important industries. And that's why gallium is considered one of the strategic elements in some countries like the United States, for instance. But what I'm gonna be talking about uh, regarding gallium is different from that. This is not the, the field of, of, of my research. So uh, I, I want to draw your attention to some of the you know, like very interesting properties of gallium. So first of them, gallium has very, very low melting point. Um, so as you see in this video, this is a spoon that's made of gallium. It looks like a metallic spoon. It's uh, like it behaves like a metal. But uh, when it's put in a cup of hot water, it's gonna, um, as you see now, it's it's gonna melt. And uh, it, it looks like now it, it's turning into like mercury like like metal now. Um, and this is because the melting point of gallium is 30 degrees Celsius, uh, so it, it, it even melts in hand if you, if you hold it in your hand, it's, it's going to melt. Um, and uh, the second property of gallium that's pretty interesting is that gallium likes to alloy and it has a very high uh, like tendency to alloy with a lot of metals. And as you see here, all these metals in blue in, or, or the elements in blue in the periodic table uh, form alloys with gallium. Um, and we know all the phase diagrams of gallium with all these elements. So it's like one very interesting uh, property of gallium. And, and I think a lot of metals do this, but the interesting thing about gallium is that it does this um, alloying uh, very easily in uh, like the ambient conditions. So for instance, here in this video, we see gallium and indium. And by just rubbing them together, uh, 
there are a few drops of, of metal or an alloy is formed and this this alloy is formed as you see it's it's formed at, at room temperature at very very simple conditions by just putting the metals in contact with each other and they form a liquid metal alloy which is something that is is not easy to happen with a lot of other metals and uh, this is other video that we see when we put gallium with aluminum um, first nothing happens but when we scratch the surface of aluminum and gallium to remove the oxides and expose the metals together you see that something interesting is happening now the, the uh, metal is or the gallium is diffusing into the solid uh, aluminum and is form, forming uh, a gallium aluminum alloy at room temperature uh, without any need to heat or apply severe conditions to the, uh, the gallium to do the, the alloy. And uh, you'd see now the, it, it looks like different, but now it's totally clear that what we have now is different from what we had in the very beginning. It's now um, an alloy with different properties, with different um, mechanical and, um, and physical properties than it used to be before. Um, and uh, what I'm going to be talking about uh, regarding the alloys of gallium is two types of alloys. One of them is the low melting point alloys, like the one we saw when we put gallium with indium. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the uh, applications of these low melting point alloys in flexible devices, um, like sensors, wires, and circuits. Um, and the second part of the talk is going to be regarding the high melting point alloys, uh, and which are the, the alloys that have low mel high melting point and their applications in imprinting and structured surfaces and in 3D printing. Um, so I'm going to start with the first part now uh, regarding the low melting point alloys. Before we talk about the low melting point alloys, I want to draw your attention to one important uh, field of research that's going on now, which is the flexible uh, and soft electronics. So these are the, the electronics that uh, are able to uh, flex or, or can be functional at uh, uh, like different operating uh, conditions, like uh, applying uh, pressure, you can strain it, you can, uh, you can flex it and it's still functional. And one of them is the flexible screens uh, or, or displays like the one that we see here. This is like 10 years old uh, figure that was announced before that the, the Samsung was uh, able to make uh, a flexible screen. And now we can find it commercially available. We have phones that that have, uh, cell phones that that have flexible uh, displays and flexible screens. Um, other application is in the solar cells. We we uh, we have now solar cells that are flexible that can be applied to surfaces, curved surfaces, or or whatever. There are other potential applications like the medical applications for. Uh, 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 like monitoring the the uh, blood pressure for monitoring the the blood rate uh, or the heart rate and the body temperature or even for analyzing the uh, the sweat to uh, to uh, like diagnose if there is any uh, um, any disease um, others are wearables like the the smart screens or the smart watches that we wear and other future applications that are possible to be um, achieved by using flexible devices and flexible uh, 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 electronics. Uh, one other application is the uh, like one of the like very uh, big applications is in the military applications where we see always these soldiers having all these uh, like devices that they are carrying regarding the communications, the night vision, and all these things. So if you can make the devices to be light, uh, uh, to be soft, and to be flexible, so they can. Uh, carry these devices without having a burden or uh, without making any uh, prohibition to their movement, then it's going to be uh, like a very, very good uh, application to them. So uh, now let's see how the gallium can fit with these applications. So gallium is, uh, as we said, the, the, the gallium indium alloy, the, the one that we showed in the video before. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> it's an eutectic alloy, alloy of allium and, uh, gallium and indium. So it has uh, like 75.5 weight percent gallium and the rest is indium. And as you see from this phase diagram, its melting point is 15.3 degrees Celsius. So it's liquid at room temperature. Um, so uh, it's not like gallium. Gallium needs a little bit of heating to be liquid, but this is liquid at the, the ambient condition. And it's and it actually super cool. So it can reach to lower temperatures and still it is in the uh, liquid phase. Um, it has low viscosity. It's almost double that of water, so it can uh, flow easily without uh, like requirement of very high pressure to force it to move. 
Um, it, ha it has high electric conductivity. It's not that as high as, as, as copper. It's maybe like one over 10 of that of copper, but still conductive enough to be used in these applications. It has very high surface tension. As you see, it, it, it looks like a, um, or takes a ball shape. And it, it here um, looks like mercury um, because this is how we see mercury usually. Uh, it's it's almost uh, 100, or it's not like, I mean, 80% um, of the of the surface tension of, uh, of mercury. Um, so it's pretty, pretty high surface tension. Um, and the interesting thing about the, the gallium alloys in general, or the technic gallium indium specifically here, is that it forms a, a passivating oxide layer. Um, what I mean by passivating oxide layer, that it uh, pre prevents any further oxidation. It forms and it prevents the oxygen from reaching to the, the, the lower levels of, or the next level uh, layers of, of the liquid matter. So it, it behaves like a water balloon now. So the liquid metal is staying inside and the oxide is acting like cover that is keeping the liquid inside and prevents it from flowing out this uh, oxide surface. And you need to apply pressure to force the liquid metal to come out of this oxide and flow um, to, to other areas uh, um, out of the inside. Um, so, uh, this oxide will dictate the shape of liquid metal actually. And there is a way that we can um, uh, we can get rid of this oxide or etch this oxide either by applying uh, dilute acid like, like this one molar HCl here, just a Q-tip uh, wet with the acid is enough to etch the oxide and then the liquid metal will bowl up again and take the spherical shape where the surface tension now is taking over and it's uh, describing the shape of the liquid metal. It's not the, um, uh, it's not the oxide. Um, so, uh, and the, that's why the liquid metal uh, has been used in many applications that uh, other liquid metals were not uh, possible uh, or, or, or couldn't be used in. Um, because, for instance, the, the, the very famous liquid metal that we know is mercury, but mercury is, uh, is, is toxic, so we cannot use it in this, in this application. So it, it has very uh, like big limitations in, in the use, but gallium and gallium alloys are not, are not toxic. They are very safe to work with. So it has been used in, uh, as, as a conductive material in many uh, devices. For instance, in flexible antennas, we can see that this antenna can be flexed, can be stretched, and the, uh, uh, and the, the, the resonance frequency of this antenna can be adjusted by adjusting the, the strain or by changing the strain that's applied to this, uh, to this uh, uh, channel. Um, it has been injected in, uh, in micro wires uh, that's made of very flexible uh, uh, polymer. And this, uh, this polymer can be stretched up to almost 100%, I mean 1000%, and it's still uh, conductive and it can um, operate without any uh, like inhibition to the, the or affect, affecting the, the properties of the device that's working. Um, and it has been used in, uh, in, in uh, sensors like pressure sensors, strain sensors, as we see here, and in biomedical applications like this device that uh, was made uh, with, with uh, liquid metal or the gallium in the alloy. And it was used to measure the heart rate and the blood pressure. So it, it has uh, like wide range of applications. And, and as you see, it, it can be applied to many surfaces. It can be flexed, it can be stretched. And because of its liquid nature, the liquid metal can flow in the channel, whatever the, the, the shape of the channel. So it doesn't uh, make any, uh, any problem with, uh, with uh, working at uh, different strains and uh, different uh, surfaces. And now let's see how the channels are made or how, how these devices are made. And this is going to be the, the, like the point where I'm going to start the work that I'm doing. So usually, uh, or, or when we started working with liquid metals, the, the classical method of, of creating the uh, channels or the devices is first to make uh, a mold and then make uh, a flexible uh, substrate like or the flexible channel that we see here. Um, we usually use PDMS, which is polydimethyl siliconine, which is silicon-based elastomer that has uh, almost 30, 40% strain. Other polymers can be used if they are uh, able or we can, can, can make microchannels out of them. And um, we make the microchannel here and then we treat the surface with oxygen plasma and simply the oxygen plasma is um, attaching or changing the surface uh, chemistry by attaching oxygen uh, uh, molecules or oxygen atoms to the surface and makes it sticky. So we, we seal these two channels together and then we inject the liquid metal into that channel. So it, it looks like a simple process and it's, it's efficient for, for, for many applications and we, we used it a lot. 
Uh, but the point is that there are some limitations to working with with this uh, method or to make the micro channels with this me method. Um, there are some geometries if they're uh, complex, then this is not going to be possible. Uh, it's a manual process, and this is the main problem. With it. It's a very manual process. Every step has to be done manually, and uh, this makes the scaling up of this process or making micro channels out of uh, liquid metal using this process on a large scale a uh, very challenging process. So there have been many uh, like papers published to uh, propose methods to uh, pattern the liquid metals instead of just making a micro channel and tunnel and filling it. So one of them was by mask deposition, uh, which is a long process where we make a sacrificial material that covers part of the substrate and then uh, we apply the liquid metal to the surface and then uh, we etch the, the sacrificial material and we end, we end up with the liquid metal covering only the areas of interest. Um, so this this is one of the methods. The other is the micro contact printing, which is um, having a probe that touches the liquid metal uh, uh, and then applies the liquid metal to the other uh, substrate of interest. So it's like the the way that people used to write a uh, long time ago with the feathers of the of the birds. They put the feather in the in the ink and then write with it and then back to the ink and so back uh, back and forth. Um, so this is how the micro contact. Of course, this is this is an automated process. So so it's it's not a manual process like what people used to do before. But still, um, uh, it's a process that is uh, kind of time consuming. Other method is the uh, direct laser patterning, which is a subtractive process where the uh, the uh, liquid metal is applied as a as a, a layer to the substrate, and then the laser is etching the areas that we don't want the liquid metal to be staying in, and then we end up with the liquid metal only in the areas of interest. Um, and, and of course, for, for all these problems, we have to apply a sealing layer at the end um, to the liquid metal to make it stable and prevent any change in the structures that are formed now. Uh, other way that was uh, proposed is to use what's called direct printing or direct writing, which is simply uh, using a syringe pump and injecting the liquid metal uh, into a syringe and then or a nozzle here and uh, using a 3d stage the uh, liquid metal is uh, like going back and forth according to the the uh, the uh, geometry of interest that we want to create um, and uh, the last one was kind of interesting and this is related to what i'm going to be talking about today which is the inkjet printing so this is one of the uh, well-established uh, patterning processes that is used in, in, in a lot of applications when we use it a lot in our um, printers and in, in the offices. Um, and the point was to create an ink uh, from the liquid metal. And this ink is just liquid metal particles suspended in a carrier solvent. Um, and this is created by sonicating the liquid metal in uh, the solvent. And I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes uh, in more details. But the, the, like to make a long story short, this is uh, how the liquid metal ink looks like. The particles are very small, and we see here that we can um, adjust the particle diameter by adjusting the sonication uh, time. So as we sonicate it for longer time, we get particles that are smaller and uh, and more suitable for the inkjet printing. And as you see, it, it was uh, it was uh, patterned on the uh, on the glove, as we see here. Uh, but the, the, the problem with this uh, process is that the particles are uh, are not conductive. So what we see here is a like very nice pattern on a glove, but it's it's not functional because the particles here are uh, are, are not conductive due to the presence of the oxide skin on the surface of each one of, of uh, oops, on each one of these balls uh, or, or these microspheres or nanospheres. So you have to apply pressure on them to pop them up and make the liquid metal come out of them and make a conductive path. And, and this, this is why uh, um, it, it, was, it was not like uh, a practical way to, to work with it. Uh, and, uh, and because of the small size of these particles, we had to apply a very high force, very high pressure to be able to break the skin and get the liquid metal out of them. So uh, what I'm going to be describing to you today or discussing with you today is the uh, process that I proposed to uh, create uh, liquid metal based electronics that are uh, like totally printed. So uh, I'm, I'm not uh, doing any manual steps inside. So the process uh, includes the printing of a base polymer layer or elastomer layer and then uh, creating a liquid metal ink, but with bigger uh, particle size, so it's easier to activate or to turn into conductive liquid metal. 
Um, and then by spray printing this on the surface, we can uh, selectively activate parts or, or turn parts of this uh, liquid metal layer into a conductive uh, liquid metal. And then by sealing it, by printing uh, a final layer of the elastomer. So it's totally automated without applying any uh, manual requirements of any manual work. Uh, this work has been uh, done using uh, like a very uh, simple 3D stage, uh, 3D movable stage. So uh, it can be even uh, uh, developed more and be more uh, more accurate by using more uh, advanced uh, material or, or, or devices. Um, so first, I'm, I'm going to describe the first step, which is the creation of the ink. So first, uh, we use only uh, liquid metal, which is uh, again, and the isopropanol, which is the carrier solvent. And um, what we see here is the uh, the sonicator tip. This is a probe sonicator, so it uh, it generates uh, uh, waves at high frequency, and these waves uh, like break the the liquid metal into particles. And this is the isopropanol, which is in, in, in the vial. And what we have here is the uh, water bath, just to because because of the high energy, the temperature gets really high. So we we uh, we put it in a liquid uh, bath to be. Uh, like absorbing the heat that's coming out of the sonication process. Um, and once the, uh, the sonicator starts, the liquid metal is broken instantaneously into small particles suspended in the solution. So this is uh, like something that we can do in 10 minutes and then we can create the ink in, uh, in no time. And, um, and as you see, I, I'm doing this only for 10 minutes to make sure that the particles are big enough and the activation process or turning the liquid metal into conductive liquid metal uh, to be an easy process without the requirement of high pressure. And we see here the particle uh, in the SEM image, the particles are in the range of uh, around 10 microns or so. Um, and this is how we find out when uh, we are done with the sonication process. And after almost 20 minutes or so, the heavy particles are setting down or, or settle down in the solution. And this is what we are interested in now, which is, are the particles that are deposited on the uh, uh, bottom of the vial, because these are the ones that have high uh, particle diameter and they are going to be easy to break and to turn conductive. And uh, we did the analysis on the particle uh, uh, distribution regarding the mass of the particles and the number of particles. And we found that uh, despite we have a lot of small particles here, but their contribution to the total mass is not very big uh, compared to the, uh, the particles that have high particle diameter whose mass percent is almost 36% of the total mass of the particle. Um, and uh, to, to see how easy this activation is, we, we just by scratching this, even by mistake, if you touch it with uh, like with a, uh, like a needle or anything like this, the particles will, will pop up instantaneously and turn into a conductive part. So this is like a good solution to the problem that we faced before with the uh, nanoparticles, because this is now very, very easy to activate. Uh, and we did more uh, quantitative analysis on this. We uh, we uh, printed a layer of the liquid metal on uh, like a surface, and we had two probes or two copper wires coming out from from uh, the bottom, and we applied a pressure between these two lines here so that we can uh, monitor how the current uh, or how the, the the conductivity changes between the two lines uh, through the liquid metal. Um, and as you see, we only require the load of only six newtons to maximum, or it's around four newtons um, and maximum 10 newtons, which is a very, very low uh, force. Um, and the, the, uh, the uh, liquid metal was conductive, so we don't require a lot of force to be applied. And you see here, some of the, uh, the, the uh, readings that we got required a little bit of, of force region uh, from four, maybe to 10 or so. And we, we think that this is because of the, uh, the difference in the uh, particle size there. So maybe some regions required uh, like more force because of the smaller particles were, were more. But still, we are, we are talking about very, very small pressure uh, compared to the pressures which were hundreds of, of pascals in the previous case. Um, and now, uh, all the steps that I'm going to describe now are done on the same stage. Uh, we're just uh, uh, connecting the, the, uh, the syringe pump that's not shown here to the nozzles here. So first, we are, we're printing the base polymer layer. And this is um, a commercial polymer that's called Smooth Tail uh, 950. And it, it can be uh, bottom line, and we can uh, 
uh, using this, the syringe pump, we can control the flow rate of the uh, or the infusion rate of the of the elastomer that's coming out of the uh, of the polymer and we of the of the nozzle, and we can we can control the thickness by either the flow rate or by the distance between the nozzle and the the surface. Uh, once we're done with this, we can uh, now uh, spray print the uh, uh, the ink to the surface, and uh, we we chose to spray print it because spray printing uh, creates a very nice uh, and uniform thickness film, and uh, it's totally dry, so we don't have any issues with uh, cracking of the film while it's drying, uh, as we used to see with other methods uh, before. And again, with the uh, control of the stage speed, we can control the thickness of the spray film and uh, according to the, the application that we want or the thickness that we are interested in. Um, and then comes the uh, point where we do the activation. And uh, what we did is we operated the stage at what we call the tapping mode, uh, which is uh, we have we have the nozzle here, and the nozzle is hitting the surface by going up and down, up and down, while it's going through the geometry that uh, we designed the the uh, program to to do and as you see it's it's creating the uh, the geometry very nicely and very uh, very accurately and uh, we we had like uh, we did a lot of work to to uh, understand how the the motion goes and this is how the the motion goes and how the the activated regions look like it's it's going to be the equal to or, or looks like the shape of the 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 uh, sphere which is this surface of the of the activating nozzle um, and we can uh, control the uh, the or, or get the the best combination of the tapping height, which is how the nozzle goes up and down away from the surface, and the stage speed, which is how fast it goes while going through this this geometry, to make sure that we have a continuous line, so it uh, it's functional, so we don't have any discontinuity in the electric path. Uh, and this is uh, like one more thing. Um, I'm not going to go into these details for the sake of time, but this is how the resistance changes with the um, center to center distance uh, to the tip diameter. So we can um, adjust how the thickness of the conductive path will look like by adjusting the again the speed and the uh, and the uh, the uh, tapping height. Uh, finally, we will uh, uh, like just seal the uh, micro channel or the uh, I'm sorry, not the micro channel. We will seal the device by uh, the same method we printed the the base polymer. Um, but in this case, we used uh, another polymer, which is the PDMS, the polydimethyl siloxane, because uh, for, some, for some reasons, first, it's a, con uh, it's a transparent uh, uh, polymer, so we can see what kind of device we have inside. The second, it's uh, silicon-based as well, so it can, it can seal with the, with the smooth fill uh, or the base polymer. <clears throat> Most importantly, that it it's a low viscosity elastomer, uh, and uh, when, when it's uncured, of course, uh, so it, it will diffuse between the particles and uh, stabilize them and prevent any further activation of the particles uh, if force is applied to them. Uh, and we were able to produce a lot of devices with this uh, with with this method. So you'd see the devices are very stable. They're like very complex geometries, like you see here. We can squeeze it, and still uh, no change to the uh, geometry is there. Uh, we created uh, like different things, like the the world map here, and uh, we created the uh, like conductive uh, maybe like funny uh, uh, geometries. Um, and this is one one thing that like I, I I thought maybe a good idea to have something like this in the paper to make it like an interesting paper and make uh, like eye, eye catching, uh, but unfortunately we're not able to publish this in the paper because it's a copyrighted material. Uh, we tried to to contact the the uh, Nickelodeon uh, channel to to tell them that we want to get your permission, but it, it was like uh, something that they couldn't understand. So we ended up putting this in the paper, fortunately. Um, and we printed this on on fabrics, so it's it's uh, possible to use this uh, method to print on uh, uh, like wearables on clothes or, or stuff like this. Uh, we created uh, pressure sensors, so you can apply pressure. Uh, you can you can monitor the the resistance. So if you apply pressure, uh, then you are changing the dimensions of the channel uh, or or the the uh, conductive path. And this will uh, result in change in the conductivity. So you can you can use it as uh, uh, a pressure sensor. 
uh, we created <clears throat> conductive wires out of this and uh, this is a flexible wire and you see you can see uh, you can stretch it you can flex it you can change its shape and it's still conductive and the circuit is uh, is connected um, finally the last thing about this part of the talk is the uh, use it for creating strain sensors so the this is the geometry that used to do the the strain sensors and we apply strain on the uh, horizontal direction um, and uh, what we have here is how we monitor the uh, resistance of the channel uh, while going through 500 strain cycles. So uh, it's, it's connected to the Anastrom machine. It's applying strain sensors as, as strain cycles uh, and then release, strains, release, and, uh, strains and releases. And for each cycle, you can see that the, the resistance increases and then decreases, increases and then decreases because we are increasing the length and the, the area gets smaller. So the resistance increases as the, um, uh, as the strain cycles are going on. So it's uh, it's uh, pretty reliable and we, we applied it as you see for 500 cycles and it's still working fine with no problems. Uh, so this is all for the first part. And now let's uh, shift gears to the second part of the talk, which is use of the uh, gallium alloys in high melting uh, or use of high melting point gallium alloys in imprinting uh, structured surfaces and 3D printing. Um, so uh, one of the main uh, motivations for this uh, um, project was to mimic what's in nature. So in nature, we find a lot of structured surfaces that do amazing and really, really amazing functions. So one of them is what's called the lotus effect or the uh, elephant ear effect. So it's a surface uh, of the one of the of the plants that whose leaves are very uh, or super hydrophobic and they are self cleaning. Uh, they, they don't get dirty any by any ways. And the reason is that there are some micro and nano structure surfaces on uh, or structures on the surface that uh, make the surface super hydrophobic. One of them is uh, one other uh, like thing in nature is the cactus uh, spines. And this is one of the mind blowing things that the cactus spines have uh, like structures on the surface that make the drops of, of air when they condense on the on the on the spines to go uh, towards the, 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 the cactus leaf and so the cactus leaf, cactus leaf can, can use this, this water. Um, so regardless how the, the spine uh, orientation is, is it vertical, is it horizontal, it can go uphill, it can go at an angle. Uh, no matter how the, the, uh, the, the spine is inclined, the drop of water will go into the spine so the spine can use this water. Uh, one other thing is the Geico feet. So the Geico feet, uh, you know, the Geico is one of the the, the reptiles that can uh, that, that can walk on the on the on the ceiling. So uh, like one of, of of the things that will like jump on your mind. How can it do this? So it, it, there are a lot of hundreds of uh, like structures on the surface which act like uh, uh, the rubber cups that uh, the suction cups that, that stick to surfaces so it uh, it enables the the geico to to stick to any uh, any surface and uh, and also for the shark skins they have like microstructures on the surface that uh, make it makes it uh, low drag and and uh, sometimes it's self cleaning and and the the interesting thing is that it's different from a shark type to the other so there are other shapes of sharks or types of sharks that have other shapes of microstructures on the surface so it's it's kind of interesting that how a surface can behave in a different way just because there are some structured surfaces uh, or structures on on this surface uh, so people were trying to mimic this and uh, do uh, or create surfaces that are microstructures to uh, achieve uh, like similar things or do functions uh, based on the type of structure on the surface. And one of the ways I'm just gonna describe two of them. One of them is using what's called the bulk metallic glasses, which are uh, metals that are cooled at very, very high rates. So they don't have a chance to form the crystalline structure. So they are uh, glassy. So they don't have, they don't have uh, crystals. And they have uh, like very superior uh, properties uh, to the, the crystalline, crystalline metals. And they can um, uh, be structured by applying a lot of high uh, or our high pressure and high temperature to molds that were created before. Uh, but again, it's, it's hard to create these bulk metallic glasses. It requires a lot of uh, like uh, materials or, or I mean uh, devices to be able to, to create these metallic glasses and to apply enough pressure to create these uh, structures. Um, one other way that people use is to use laser machining, which is applied laser to the surface to create these structures 
uh, using using uh, the laser beam, and you see they can uh, we can make a surface super hydrophobic, as we see in in this figure. Um, so what we uh, were doing is we wanted to find uh, like an easy alternative to this, and this is by creating an alloy. Instead of using the bulk metallic glasses from very high temperature to go to the low temperature, we're going to start at the very low temperature by creating an alloy of gallium and any other metal powder and uh, letting them alloy at, at room temperature or close to room temperature and then turn into a solid uh, structure uh, that uh, will take any shape based on the mold that we, we are going to do. So we're going to mix them together and then apply uh, pressure uh, to it uh, on a, on a mold and then release it after it's uh, it's cured or it's uh, it's done with the alloying. So it seemed like a very nice idea. And uh, then the, this question came, which metal that we are going to use? There are like many metals, as we saw in the beginning, there are like a bunch of metals that we can use that we, that have high affinity to uh, to alloy with, with gallium. Um, and we thought about uh, some of them um, who's uh, like uh, uh, phase diagram with, with gallium have uh, a window where it can form a solid structure at room temperature. Uh, we thought, uh, for instance, for uh, copper, for silver, magnesium, aluminum, and other metals, but there were some limitations that, uh, because, because the, the, the options are a lot, we, we had to narrow our, our options somehow. So first we thought of uh, using uh, metal powders that are cheap. So we excluded uh, um, uh, expensive metals like silver, like uh, gold and, and the, these other metals. Um, and some metals like aluminum and magnesium are not safe to work with. So aluminum powder is uh, explosive and uh, or I think it's flammable and magnesium powder is explosive. So despite having a good window here for, for working with uh, gallium or to create a solid structure to temperature, we were not able to uh, use them for safety precaution or for safety reasons. So we ended up to use copper. And as you see, uh, copper has this window here uh, that uh, we can mix uh, copper and, uh, and and gallium uh, with any of this uh, these ratios. And to, we will end up either with this phase or with this phase, which are both solid phases at, at room temperature, uh, which is which is great. So this is what we uh, were thinking of. So uh, we are uh, trying to find out the optimum mixing ratio. And what we mean by optimum is the mixing ratio that will enable easiness of mixing. So uh, to, to make the mixing easy and to make a paste that's workable so we can apply it to the surface and uh, make imprints out of it. And we have enough workable time so it, it doesn't harden or doesn't uh, turn solid very quickly. So we have time to, to work with it or, or to work with it until we're done. So it's, it's pretty much like the, the dental amalgams that people used to use a uh, long time ago, some long time, maybe 10 years or 15 years ago um, to, to fill the cavities in the teeth. Uh, so they're mixed uh, in, in uh, and, and then they harden in, I think maybe an hour or less. So it, it gives you some time to work with and apply to the surface or, or to the tooth. So this is uh, the same idea. And then uh, we want it to be a hard mixture at, after, after, after we're done. So these, the, the end uh, product to be a solid, uh, solid surface or solid mixture. Uh, so we did a lot of work on different mixing ratios to find out which is the uh, ratio that will give us all the requirements that we are looking for. So we tried um, ratios starting from 48% gallium up to 82% gallium. And we found that this is uh, what we got after uh, like doing all the experiments. Uh, we tried the mixtures uh, or, or we tested the, the, the shape of the mixture or the texture of the mixture after a few minutes, uh, after 30 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius, after 60 minutes at 60 degrees Celsius overnight and after three days. Um, and they all turned solid in the beginning because gallium, uh, it, it's, it's a solid at, at 30, uh, it melts at 30 degrees Celsius. So we do the experiments around 20, 25 degrees. So it, uh, they all turned solid, but when we put them at a little bit higher temperature, um, the, uh, the behavior changes. So uh, at some part it's paste, uh, which is good. So this is what's called a workable paste. Uh, and then it turns after some time to be uh, in, in some cases to be a crunchy solid and then to be a solid here it's a squishy solid and here it doesn't turn to be solid because the gallium in this region is too much so we ended up to choose this uh, this mixture which is somewhere between 50 uh, 
2% and 68% gallium. Um, and um, finally, with, with more refining, we ended up with uh, 65 and 35 percentage, which is the ratio that was, was the best ratio to work with. Um, however, working with this ratio uh, ended up to be uh, like not very good because of uh, we have some imperfections. The mixing was very, very hard. We have to apply a lot of pressure to mix the gallium with the metal powder or the copper powder. Uh, and the rough uh, the surfaces were rough and not, uh, not, uh, not good uh, after, after uh, doing the imprinting. So we, uh, we were thinking of the reasons of this, and we ended up with one of two reasons uh, after a lot of research. One of them is the oxide that's formed on the surface of copper, which prevents the mixing with gallium, and that's why you have to apply a lot of force uh, to scratch it and then get the gallium to mix with it. And the second is the presence of ligands, which are uh, like uh, organic uh, compounds that uh, are, are assembled on the surface to prevent the agglomeration of the particles. So this is like one thing that prevented the, the mixing. So one thing that we thought of is to mill the particles and milling is simply by putting them uh, in uh, like in a bottle like this uh, and with, uh, with uh, uh, zirconia balls and to shake them for like 30 minutes at high frequency. And this is what we ended up with. This is the original shape of the powder. And this is how the powder looked like after we are done with the milling. And we found that the particles are shape is, is totally different. We, and we believe we changed the, the, the uh, structure of the particles, uh, not the particles, I mean the, 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 the solid structure of the, of the particles. And then uh, maybe the gray boundaries and, and stuff are, are uh, are affected with the uh, with the milling, and that's why mixing was very very easy. Then once we put the gallium with the with this powder, it was like a piece of cake. Now we can do this. So we we were able to uh, replicate uh, or, or or do imprinting of, of of many things. So we we see here this is a penny that we were able to make imprints of. So this is not the original penny. This is the gallium copper alloy imprint of uh, of one one cent or, a, or I mean of, of, of a penny. Um, and you see it, it does a good uh, good replication and and this is one easy one easy mold that we can make because it's it's simple and we have structures that are hundreds of microns of, of size so we can we can replicate these very nicely and very easily without uh, without like applying uh, a lot of pressure we just put the the mold a little bit of pressure and it's done and these are some uh, like uh, molds that we made in in the lab uh, and then we wanted to try to go for smaller uh, structure size. So we went to molds that we have that were around 10 micron of, of width. And we were able to replicate them, but there were some um, like defects here. It's not uh, doing the replication very, very nicely. So we thought of going for smaller particle size. So we used 50, uh, the, uh, I mean, 500 nanometers power, power, uh, nanoparticles and 70, 70 nanometer particles and they, um, they work better when you go for smaller particle size, it makes the, the replication even better. Um, I think I have only three or four more minutes. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna skip this slide and uh, I'm gonna go for this directly. So this is uh, uh, like what we got after replicating the uh, molds with the copper nanoparticles instead of the uh, copper powder. And you see, we were able to get the 10 micron lines and uh, uh, it's it's still not perfect, but it's good enough, uh, or it's better than it used before, uh, used to be before. And here, there is one other mold that was easy to get, which is the uh, structures on the CDs. So you know that CD has this colors when you, when you are uh, on the back side of it. Uh, and this is because there are these micro and nano structures on the surface, which is around 100 of nanometers, like 690 nanometers and around one micron. So these uh, these structures are uh, simple. You can break a CD or, or cut it with a, with the a scissors and you can uh, break it into, or the layers, uh, separate the layers from, from each other and then replicate the uh, structures on the, on the CD. So we were able to do this and we, uh, we tested the uh, hydrophobicity of the surfaces that have uh, flat surfaces or the uh, those who have the CD replica structures or those who have the 10 micron lines and they all uh, like seem to be working. We have here different contact angle that's different than here, that's different than here. And we tested this or compared this with what, what we got from the theoretical models and it seemed to be uh, like very, uh, very close to what we get uh, theoretically based on the dimensions of the structures that we have on the surface. Um, one last thing is that uh, we were interested in doing uh, 3D printing and using this as a, uh, uh, an ink for 3D printing. 
Uh, however, this didn't go well. Uh, and uh, the reason is because when we inject this out of the needle or, or the nozzle, um, the, the, the mixture acts like sand and water. So the, 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 the copper powder uh, is, is kept inside and the uh, what is, is infused out is uh, just a gallium. So uh, this is something that we still uh, like need to work on and find uh, a solution to because it's, it's a very promising because the ways that we people do metal 3D printing now is by mainly the selective laser centering, which is a very tough pro process and it's a time consuming process. Uh, it requires a lot of metal powders. And, and um, if, if we can get this to work for 3D printing, this is gonna be kind of revolutionary thing in the uh, field of 3D printing. Uh, finally, we did some analysis to the samples and we, as you see here for the EDS mapping, it seems that the gallium and copper are homogeneously distributed in the uh, whole uh, sample that we have here. And you see from the XRD analysis that most of the peaks here that we see are for copper gallium 2, which is the phase that we expected from the phase diagram. Uh, there's still some gallium, some copper oxides, but the majority is uh, copper gallium too. Uh, we also did an in situ XRD, which is XRD uh, for the uh, mixture while uh, starting from its mixing until it's cured or it's uh, the intermetallics are formed. So you see in the beginning here, um, the, 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 the yellowish color means that the, the more we have. So we, this is copper gallium too. We saw it's in the beginning at time zero, there is a very small amount. This is almost in, we started in five minutes after, after the mixing. So there have been some start of, of formation of copper gallium alloys in the beginning. And as time goes, the amount of copper gallium too gets more and the copper is consumed. So 400 minutes, we were able to achieve almost 45% uh, volume percent or volume fraction of copper gallium too in the mixture of copper and gallium after the uh, after the mixing. Um, and of course, as, as time goes, if we leave it for, for more time, it's, it's now solid, but if you leave it for more time, it gets even uh, um, higher uh, as we saw in the, the XRD in the, in the uh, last slide. Uh, so for the future work, there are other options that are available and there are many, many options that we can, we can work with. So first of them is using um, other metal powders than copper. So the reason we used copper was, uh, as I said, because we we were looking for a, a cheap uh, powder that we can use. And the other reason that, that this was the powder that we had available at that time. So we, we started working with it and then we ended the work with it. But there are other options that, that, are, uh, that we can work with uh, and they, that have uh, or, or can form solid structures or solid uh, alloys that have higher melting point, maybe 800 or 700. That's higher, way higher than what we can achieve with the copper gallium. Um, the other option is to make uh, like what people do in stainless steel to, to think of uh, like a combination of different uh, metal powders. So we can, we can um, may, maybe mix copper and cobalt. We can mix copper and chromium. I don't know any, any other options that, we, that are available. So this, this will, will make endless number of options that we can we can use uh, and this the, this might have good impact on the uh, flow properties of the mixture and can make it more uh, suitable for 3d printing um, and uh, we can use this to control the time that it takes to harden and to solidify uh, so this is a good a good uh, like thing that uh, can be can be done in the future um, so by this i can end my uh, my presentation and uh, just to give you a wrap up of what I did today, I just talked with you about the gallium uh, and its uh, low melting point and its ability to alloy with a wide range of metals and the uh, uh, the options of using the liquid metal as a conductive material in applications of flexible electronics and wearables in sensors and in using the high melting point gallium for room temperature in printing and as a, like a good candidate for 3D printing applications. So. Um, I thank you for your attention and uh, um, I'm happy to have any questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. Very interesting uh, presentation. New, new dimensions for us as an, as an engineer to think about uh, mm -hmm. the research. Uh, meanwhile, the student get ready to ask a question. Uh, doctor, can you go to slide 44? Uh, this is uh, these di diagrams tells us mean the mixing, right? Yep, 
these are the the phases this, that can be formed yeah different the, phases uh, right. phase diagram so uh, uh, how do you decide which phase you want to have so yeah this is a good question so it it depends mainly on uh, so, so the 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 goal is to do the mixing at room temperature so uh, we are thinking of this uh, part of the phase diagram so the part at, at the very bottom around 30 degrees celsius or so um, and then we think of, as I, I mentioned, that we, we want to do the mixing at ambient conditions. So we want to do the mixing uh, or, or to get a mixture uh, that can be easily mixed and that can uh, form the intermetallic at, at room temperature. So uh, that's why we're, we're thinking of something around 50% or so. Uh, and we're, we're looking at something like this, uh, maybe like this. So uh, it, it, can, it can give us a chance to do the mixing easily. And the same time to form uh, an inter a solid intermetallic uh, by the few or, or when when the gallium and and the metal diffuse together. Uh huh. So it's mainly the room temperatures, right? The mean right. the normal temperatures. Right. Right. Okay. So maybe a little and, bit higher, but this is this is the goal here. Uh huh. And the one more thing. So wherever these uh, these um, gallium alloys are used, so they are always mean in the form of alloy, not as just pure gallium because its melting point is low. Right, is right. Yeah, yeah. Gallium, gallium cannot be used in, in any of, of like of, of the applications that require solids because as, as I showed you in the beginning, it's if it's just hot water, it's gonna melt it's gonna melt. So you have to you have to have it in, in an alloy shape so that it has higher melting point than it uses to be in the in the elemental state. So it means it can uh, this uh, aluminium, this gallium can easily uh, move to the water in the sources, right? Yeah, but water it's body. not water soluble. So so it, it it's, ah. uh, yeah it uh, like it, it it forms the oxide and the oxide keeps it from from doing any other thing. So it's oh it's okay not okay soluble okay. Water. So passive right. passive yeah. layer of the oxide. Exactly. exactly. So so it's ah. it's soluble in acids maybe in, in HCl uh, and and many other acids, but but for water it's it's safe to use with with, with water. Mm, oh, interesting. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Umar. He's asked, how does gallium exist in natural form? Are there mines for it? Okay, so this is a good question as well. So gallium uh, is is not available in nature as uh, like as elemental gallium. So it's formed as or it's it's available in nature in uh, as impurity in uh, in other metal ores like uh, aluminum, and like zinc, and other metal ores. And it's uh, it's formed or, or it's available in in mostly in gallium oxide form. And then it's extracted and then reduced to be to be gallium. So, um, so it's, it's uh -huh. there are no there are no mines. If the question about the mines of gallium, there are not such a thing. It's it's uh, it's an impurity, and and that's why it's it's available in nature with with a high percentage. So it's it's not a rare element, but it's a scarce element. So you, you cannot find it easily, but you can you can find it. Mm -hmm. So it means it's a, uh, it always exists as a form of alloy or oxides, huh? Right. Uh huh. Okay, doctor, let's see if uh, there is any more questions. I think there is no more questions. And okay. thank you so much, doctor. Very interesting presentation. Thanks. Honestly, I learned many new things mm -hmm. uh, from this. I always, we always heard about this, uh, this printing and this flexible devices, but we don't know what is the science behind. Anyhow, yeah, thank this, you. This uh, presentation gives some uh, good information about that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, doctor. So mm -hmm. nice of you. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Excellent thanks for presentation. Thanks for giving me the, uh, the opportunity to share my research with you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay. Salam alaikum.